Good morning, everyone. This is Professor Muhammad Farval. In this lecture, I'll be talking about standards of textuality or criteria of textuality. This simply means what makes discourse discourse or what makes a text a text. Why do we accept something as a text, but reject something as a non-text? Or we accept something as discourse and reject another as non-discourse. Back in 1978, Debo Grant and Drischler talked about seven standards of textuality. Two of them stand out as more important than the others. These are coherence and cohesion. So I'll be starting talking about these two standards of textuality, then move on to the rest of them. Let me first start with a distinction between cohesion and coherence. Cohesion is a linguistic concept, something we find within the text. In other words, we can pinpoint cohesive ties within the text, and these cohesive ties are supposed to make the text stick together. That's why we call it cohesion. So cohesion is something that makes the text stick together. It connects the parts of the text together in different ways. We'll talk about the different types of cohesion later on. But for now, let's just say that cohesion is a linguistic phenomenon found within the text and this contrasts with coherence coherence is something is a mental concept a psychological kind of concept and which is brought to the text by the recipient whether the recipient is a reader or a listener. So here the receiver decides whether a text is coherent or not. So in order for something to be called discourse it must make sense. If it doesn't make sense, then it would not be considered as discourse. But how would it make sense? The concept of coherence tells us that whether something makes sense or not, whether a text makes sense or not, has to do with the receiver. If, for example, the text talks over the head of the receiver, then that text would not make sense to that particular receiver. But if it is interpretable, if it is understandable to someone else to another receiver then that text would be coherent coherent to him or her this simply means that coherence is brought to the text by the receiver it's not within the text but we have to recognize the fact that cohesion does not cause coherence. Coherence may exist independently of cohesion. But in connected discourse, all right, cohesion is there. We cannot find, for example, a, a text, let's say, comprising one paragraph or one page or what have you, all right, that is devoid of cohesion. Why? Because the text has to stick together and it is 
cohesion that makes it stick together. But it's possible to find text, short texts that are not cohesive, but still we can make sense of them. They are coherent in other words. For example, John did not come to class this morning. It was raining heavily. Not that this text, many text is not cohesive. Simply because we don't find cohesive ties between the first sentence and the second sentence, but we find it coherent. We figure it out in this way that the heavy rain forbade him from or for, prevented him from coming to class or forbade him to come to class. So here we have a cause result relation between the two sentences, despite the fact that we this cause result or cause effect re relation is not explicit, it is implicit. So it's a matter of coherence here. We can make this logical relation between the two sentences explicit by using a logical connector, for example, because or therefore John did not come to class this morning because it was raining heavily. It was raining heavily. Therefore, John did not come to class this morning. Okay, now, we, as we can see, it's possible for coherence to exist independently of cohesion. But in long discourses and connected discourse, it's impossible for coherence to be found independently of cohesion. Because, for example, an essay cannot be devoid of cohesion. Even a paragraph is supposed to feature cohesion. Okay. But cohesion does not cause coherence as such. That's why if something does not make sense, then it would not be coherent. So, for example, John did not come to class this morning. His mother was eating breakfast. Or his mother was having breakfast. Okay, is, can we impose coherence on this kind of text? And the answer is no, all right? So we cannot conceptualize something like that because his mother was having breakfast, he couldn't come to class this morning, all right? This is something that does not sound logical to us. So such a text would be considered incoherent to most of us. So coherence is something that is brought to the text by the receiver. That's why what's coherent to someone might be incoherent to someone else. For example, if you give a medical text to a medical doctor, it would be coherent to him. But if you give the same text to someone whose specialization is different, it might not make a lot of sense to him because of the terminology used there. So, Coherence is something relative. It has to do with the receiver. It is the receiver who brings coherence to the text. So it's something psychological, something that is mental, which is imposition of the, the receiver rather than the text itself. So coherence is an attribute of the receiver, whereas Cohesion is an attribute of the text. Now, if we look at cohesion, we can see that cohesion manifests itself in different types. 
there are two types of cohesion. We have semantic cohesion and we have grammatical cohesion. Sometimes cohesion is a matter of semantics. Sometimes it's a matter of grammar. The most familiar type of cohesion is reference. The fact that we use referential elements to stand for lexical entities. So this is something which is found in probably all discourses, all right? If we exclude many discourses where, okay, one would do without X referring back to Y. Reference or referential elements generally fall into two categories. We have endophoric reference and we have exophoric reference. Endophoric reference is found within the text. If you look at a text, within that text, you find examples of endophoric reference where you have a lexical entity for example appearing at one point and later on you have a pronoun referring back to it and this is called anaphoric reference and sometimes the other way around sometimes you find the pronoun appearing first and later on you have the lexical entity and this is called cataphoric reference for example, John went shopping this morning. He bought a pair of shoes. Okay, so he refers back to John. So this is an example of anaphoric reference. Whereas in a text like the following, in his visit to Paris, John went to the Eiffel Tower. His here, as you can see, appears first. Then later on, we have John. So the relationship between his and John is cataphoric rather than anaphoric. In both cases, we have endophoric reference, reference within the text, which is very familiar in this course. But we also have exophoric reference where we have a referential element in a discourse referring to something in the context, an entity in the context, some, an entity that is recoverable from the context. For example, uh, a teacher addressing his students. I wanted to prepare this chapter for next week. I and you here refer exphorically. I refers to the teacher and you refers to the students in that classroom. So here I and you are used exphorically rather than endophorically. So this has so the difference between exphoric reference and endophoric reference has to do with whether the referent is within the discourse or not. If the referent is within the discourse, then it is endophoric. If the referent is outside the discourse, in the external world, and is recoverable within that situation, then it's exophoric reference. The second type of cohesion is conjunction. The fact that we have logical words, logical connectors that tell us what's going on in terms of logic. X for X causing Y. X is added to Y. X contrasts with Y. X comes after Y. Okay, all these kind of relations can be expressed using conjunctions. So conjunctions fall in, basically fall into four categories. We have addition, additive markers, 
or markers that mark addition, the most familiar is and or either or neither nor okay also in addition all these connectors mark addition so they are addition markers we have cause result markers or cause effect markers therefore consequently as a result because all these are cause result markers we have contrast markers Whereas, but, but is the most contrast markers. What's the difference between but, but and and? It has to do with one being an addition marker and the other being a contrast marker. So wherever you find but, you must find a contrast between X and Y. However, nevertheless, whereas on the one hand, on the other hand, all these are contrast markers. Not that we cannot put all contrast markers in one bag. Why? Because some of them are adversative and some of them are concessive in nature. And one has to be aware of this key difference between them. For example, but can be used both adversatively and concessively. So you can talk about X and Y using but. John is intelligent, but Mary is stupid. Not that here you're talking about two people. So this is a complete contrast between two entities. But you can also use but, use, use but talking about John alone by saying John is intelligent but he's negligent okay here you're talking about june not that if you use a an adversative contrast marker other than but you cannot do this for example if you want to use whereas whereas is an adversative contrast mark so you can use it when talking about john and mary but you cannot use it when talking about john alone so you can say john is intelligent whereas mary is stupid but you cannot say john is intelligent whereas he is negligent why because whereas is an adversative contrast marker you can use however here why because however is concessive john is intelligent however he is negligent so here we have to be aware of the fact that we have both adversative contrast markers and concessive contrast markers. One more thing about conjunctions here has to do whether they are used intersententially or intrasententially. Not that. Holiday and Hassan, 1976, in their classic book, Cohesion in English, talk about these types of cohesion. And they talk about conjunctions as belonging to cohesion only if they are inter intersentential. So, however, for example, is a cohesive type. Nevertheless, on the one hand, on the other hand, whereas, but they looked at subordinators like because, despite the fact that as a matter of grammatical dependences, 
something that does not make a lot of sense. Why? Because therefore and because discursally, they mean the same thing. They only differ in their syntax, the way they are used. Therefore, is used intersententially, whereas because is used intrasententially. Intersententially simply means between sentences, whereas because is used intrasententially within the same sentence. But it really doesn't make a difference. And so far as the logical relationship between the propositions is concerned, it really doesn't matter whether you say John was sick, therefore he did not come to class, or John did not come to class because he was sick. These two sentences or these two texts paraphrase each other. So the logical relationship between the two propositions is one and the same. So because is a conjunction just like, however, this simply means that conjunctions can be both intersentential and intrasentential, not only intersentential. The same applies to contrast markers. Despite the fact that John was sick, he came to class. John was sick, however, he came to class. Not that these two sentences or these two texts paraphrase each other, they have the same logic. So conjunctions can be both used across sentence boundary and within sentence boundary. It's a matter of co connecting propositions, whether intersententially or intersententially. So the next type of Conjunction is contrast markers, which I have already discussed. And the last one consists of temporal markers, markers that mark the sequence of things, time, something like after, before. Notice that after, before are used intrasententially. And they connect proposition together. But we can, we also have intersentential temporal marker afterwards, later on. What applies to contrast markers and cause result markers also applies to temporal markers. Okay, so it's, it's just after, for example, after may be used intrasententially. It may also be used intersententially. After John went shopping, he had an app. Okay, now I'm using it within the same sentence. John went shopping. After that, he had an app. Or afterwards, he had an app. Okay, not that. that Two texts paraphrase each other. So temporal marks can be used both intrasententially and intersententially. The next type of cohesion is lexical cohesion, which is found in discourse or writing. If you look at connected discourse, you find you have to find reference, you have to find conjunctions, you have to find lexical cohesion, which marks two types of relations syntagmatic relations and paradigmatic relations. So X and Y can be related either syntagmatically, horizontally, or paradigmatically paradigmatically or vertically. So sense relations like synonymy, hyponymy, 
antinomy. All these are found in this course. We find them in this course. For example, if you have a text about lions, all right, you would come across the word animal, the word beast, the word cat, the word all. Oh, so all of these mark paradigmatic sense relations. Metonymy, so vertically in this course, we find all these sense relations. We find synonyms, we find hyponymy, we find metonymy, part whole relations. We find antonyms. Okay, it's impossible to write a text about happiness without mentioning sadness. Is that possible? I don't think so. If you are if you write an essay about happiness, you'll at one point in time you'll have to mention the adjective sad and the noun sadness. Syntagmatically, we have collocations. So note that in paradigmatic relation, we don't find X and Y occurring next to each other. Unless there is, unless they are separated by a a punctuation kind of mark, like for example, a slash separating for example, happiness from sadness, which simply means that the relation between happiness and sadness is vertical rather than horizontal. Whereas collocations, well, for example, if X relates to Y horizontally, then it's a syntagmatic relation. So, for example, pregnant has a syntagmatic relation of any entity that is plus organism, for example, or plus mammal. So you can talk about a pregnant woman, you can talk about a pregnant cow, but you cannot talk about a pregnant table, for example. Why? Because there is no syntagmatic relation between pregnant and table. Pay, for example, has syntagmatic relations that with many things. And sometimes the syntagmatic relations are rather restricted. And sometimes they are open in nature. For example, pay, collocates with anyone, with anything relating to money. But in a more restrictive kind of way, it collocates with attention, for example, pay attention or pay respect, pay visits. Not that the relation between pay and attention is more restricted than the relation between pay and cash, between pay and cash, for example. Why? Because there it has to do with money, but here in pay attention, it has nothing to do with money. Sometimes the, these syntagmatic relations are highly restricted. Not like the case of not like the case of pay. For example, hazel. Hazel eyes. Hazel nuts. We do not go beyond these, do, do we? For example, as an adjective. Hazel describes eyes in, in English. This does not apply to Arabic, for example, where Hazel can, Asadi can describe a variety of things. So Asadi in Arabic can openly collocate with lots of things. So it has many syntagmatic relations with different entities, but in English, it only has one syntagmatic relation with eyes, hazel eyes. In some cases, you all right, 
you might find a word that only appears in the context of another word. In Arabic, for example, Hamiyat al Watis, when describing a battle, al Watis would never occur anywhere else. It has only one expression, Hamiyat al Watis. So, Watis here is a collocate of Hamiyat, Hamiyat. So, so here, Hami can collocate with lots of things, but in this particular context, Hamiya only collocates with, or what is only could occurs in the context of Hamiya. Okay, this is. All right, so here we have, when it comes to lexical cohesion, we have to distinguish between paradigmatic relations, which are vertical in nature, and syntagmatic relations, which are horizontal in nature. And in most texts, we find what we call lexical chains. Lexical chains, lexical items belonging to the same field. For example, if you have a text about cooking, you'll find different types of dishes. The word chef would be there. So anything relating to kitchen might be there in order to fo form what we call lexical chains, which make the text lexically stick together. So, so far we have talked about three types of cohesion, which are semantic in nature. We have reference, we have conjunctions, and we have lexical relations or lexical cohesion. Repetition is one important manifestation of lexical cohesion. Repetition is inherent in discourse. If you look at any piece of connected discourse, you'll find repetition. You'll find, for example, the same word repeated more than once, especially keywords. Keywords are repeated again and again within the same text, and sometimes in different forms. And sometimes you use a synonym instead of the same word or a hyponym. Okay, so repetition can be formal or semantic. Formal if you are repeating the same form, the same word. And semantic if you instead use a synonym or a hyponym or a metonym. The other type of cohesion or the other category of cohesion is grammatical rather than semantic, which involves two types of cohesion, ellipsis and substitution. And they usually interact with each other. And in English, this is very common, especially in conversational kind of English, all right? Sim we simply use general words, substitution. And we also use ellipsis, for example. For example, yes, no questions. When responding to yes, no question. This is a familiar situation where we use ellipsis. We don't give complete answers, do we? We say yes, no. Or we use auxiliary, yes, I do. Do you go shopping very often these days? 
and you answer either yes or yes i do notice that yes only involves ellipses yes i do involve both ellipses and substitution do here substitutes a verb phrase some act you did in arabic we also use al hadf wal ibdal ذَهَبَ عَلِيٌ إِلَى بَارِيسَ وَكَذَلِكَ فَعَلَ عَوَّاد وَكَذَلِكَ فَعَلَ وَكَذَلِكَ كَذَلِكَ here all right كَذَلِكَ here is an example of substitution In Arabic, we use na'am la in response to yes, no questions. And also, this is an example of ellipsis. So, ellipsis and substitution are grammatical in nature. In substitution, we use, we instead of repeating the same lexical item, we use a general word. For example, I like these grapes but not those ones, ones here. Substitutes the lexical noun grapes. Okay, that's what we mean by ellipsis and substitution. So, cohesion manifests itself in five types. Reference, conjunctions, lexical cohesion ellipsis and substitution all together these types of cohesion make the text stick together they make it cohesive okay so so far we have talked about these two important types or these two, yeah, important standards of textuality, coherence and cohesion, which differ by the fact that cohesion is found within the text, whereas coherence is brought to the text by the receiver, which simply makes cohesion a linguistic phenomenon, whereas coherence a psychological or a mental phenomenon now if we move on to look at the other standards of textuality or the other criteria of textuality one can argue i personally argue that all of them would come under coherence at the end of the day but one can look at them individually informativity for example informativity is a standard of textuality informativity again has to do with the receiver whether something is informative or not has to do with the receiver for example, if I'm talking to you about something you already know, would what I say to you be informative? And the answer is no. Why? Because you would be probably thinking of something else while I'm talking or having a nap. Or, and that's what happens to many people all right, when they go to lectures, which bring up things that are familiar to everyone. So you find the audience dozing. Why? Because the lecture is not informative to them. It would only be informative to someone who does not know the stuff. So informativity here correlates with predictability. 
that is predictable. The discourse, the more informative it is. And the more predictable, the less informative it is. If, for example, you already know what we mean by informativity here, what I have said about informativity would not be informative to you. As simple as that. But if you have not heard of this before, and I have just explained to you what we mean by informativity, then this would be informative to you. So informativity has to do with predictability of discourse. The more predictable, the less informative. The less predictable, the more informative. Situationality is another criteria of textuality mentioned by De Grand and Drischler. Situationality has to do with the fact that it's the situation that imposes meaning on discourse. Such the situation would tell you whether, for example, someone is ironic or not. John is a genius. When someone, everyone else knows that he's an idiot. Okay, so situationality here would tell you that the speaker means that he's an idiot, but instead of saying, telling you that he's an idiot, he's saying that he's a genius because he assumes that you are cooperating with him and you'll get the message anyway. I talked about this in some detail in my lecture on conversational implications. So I don't want to do this again. But one can imagine the same utterance be used in different situations to mean different things. For example, do you smoke at the clinic is not the same in the corridor, talking to a friend of yours, do you, or to someone you've met in the corridor, do you smoke? Or someone you have just met, do you smoke? You might be offering a cigarette. Or you might be requesting a cigarette, a cigarette from him. But at the clinic, when, for example, when the medical doctor asks you, do you smoke? Do you think he's offering you a cigarette or he's Wasting you to give him a cigarette? Um, no. So, okay, here, the situationality, the situation makes a difference. Well, what are you laughing at in the classroom versus in the corridor? Again, they would not function in the same way. So, would you venture telling your teacher what you're laughing at? Or would you just apologize? Why? Because in the classroom, it functions as an order. In the corridor, it might function as a question that begs an answer. The next standard is acceptability. And this has to do with norms. But not that acceptability does not deprive a text of is coherent. You might, for example, you might violate the norms when producing discourse, but still your discourse would make sense. So acceptability sharpens or perfects the discourse. Why? Because you abide by the norms in the language you are using. Non-native speakers of a language are often accused of violating the norms. Okay, their discourse is not, not natural enough. Well, for example, they, do, they violate collocational restrictions, social norms. So, but their discourses would make sense, but so, Acceptability is something that perfects discourse, but does not deprive discourse of sense or of meaning. Discourse can be 
meaningful, but might what might not fare well when it comes to acceptability. And not that acceptability may differ between cultures. So what's acceptable in one culture may not be acceptable in another in terms of norms. For example, when responding to a compliment in Arabic, one of the most familiar responses is to offer the complimented item or what? To, what, to comment on the eyes of the complimenter. Not that responding to a compliment in English, saying your eyes are beautiful. All right, it, this violates the norms. Okay, it's not acceptable in English, but it is acceptable in Arabic. Offering the complimented item. All right, assuming that someone, all right, an Englishman compliments you on your watch and you respond by saying it's all yours. Yeah, he might what? He might ask you to give it to him. Did you mean it? You didn't mean it, but here you are what, violating the norms. That's what we say in Arabic, but by way of lip service, we don't mean what we say. So this is a matter of acceptability, or when you write a letter, for example, it's a matter of acceptability it started with an opener. And also, you have to close your letter by okay, best regards or kind regards, love, what have you. But a letter without, for example, a closing formula or without an opening formula would not, would okay, lack acceptability in, in English as well as in Arabic. Okay, this might be universal. And the next standard is intentionality. And again, this intentionality comes under coherence, all right? Whenever you open your mouth to produce this course or whenever you put pen on paper to produce this course, you have to have some intentions. Is it possible to produce this course without having intentions? you would be producing nonsense. So intentionality lies at the heart of producing this course. So it's a matter of coherence. Just if you produce something that is nonsense, then it's incoherent. And here, your intentions are not only blurred, but rather are what, destroyed. Why? Because you have to have intentionality and this intentionality must make sense. In other words, there must be coherence when it comes to, your, to expressing your intentions in this course. And finally, we come to intertextuality, which is the last, the last standard of textuality according to Dubogrand and Dressler. And to me, intertextuality comes under coherence as well, but it is a very interesting topic on its own. Intertextuality simply means that a discourse cannot come from a vacuum. Discourse can be looked at as what? Building blocks. So when we produce our discourse, we fall back on previous discourses. I couldn't have given this lecture without falling back on previous discourses. It's true that I may have come up with something that belongs to me, but at the end of the day, this lecture is based on previous discourses. And that's how discourse is produced. Discourse does not come from a vacuum. We do not have a discourse that is 100% original. This is a big lie. 
Okay. Every discourse must have made use of previous discourses. So intertextuality enriches our discourse. How does it manifest itself in discourse? It does so in many forms. Maybe the most familiar is quoting. When you quote, for example, a line of poetry to support your argument or a Quranic verse or what have you, okay? Quoting is an interesting manifestation of intertextuality. Paraphrase is another familiar manifestation of intertextuality. And this is based on the fact that content is rather constant, but form is variable. This simply means that the same idea can be said in many different ways. So it can an idea can be paraphrased. And that's what we do when we engage in research, right? Instead of instead of quoting, which is usually frowned upon in research, especially long quotes, we paraphrase. If we have to refer to someone else's idea, we don't have to quote him. We can paraphrase what he said and keep going to inject our dis to, to inject our discourse with our own ideas, paraphrasing, remodeling, remodeling. We sometimes remodel existing expressions in order to communicate our own ideas. In today's world, all, all roads lead to the White House. Okay. I have remodeled an existing proverb. All roads lead to Rome. But the motive is different now. It's not the same motive. Okay, as used familiarly, the proverb means that there are alternative ways of doing the same thing. But in my remodeling, I'm just communicating the idea that all decision making in this world is made at the White House. This is what we call remodeling. And remodelings are all around. We use language creatively. We come up with our own expressions based on parent expressions. Okay, so plagiarism. What about plagiarism? This is a, a, a bad manifestation of intertextuality. All right. That is when you quote without mentioning the source. You intertextualize, but here it is you plagiarize. So plagiarize is a bad manifestation of intertextuality. All these are manifestations of intertextuality. So intertextuality makes our discourse more interesting, more creative. But all this pours into the glass of coherence. So we make our discourse more coherent by intertextualizing with previous discourses. And notice that we can intertextualize in order to support some idea or in order to oppose some idea. And let me finish with two examples. Here, one opposes the motive and the other supports the motive. And the one, okay, cases where we oppose the existing motive involves contra textuality. And cases where, where we support the motive, the same motive, 
involves intertextuality. So here we can, one can talk about two types of intertextuality, intertextuality and contra-textuality. When Ahmed Shawqi, for example, stood at the ruins of Granada and remembered al buhdir remembered what al buhdir said about the ruins of Kisra, Persian palaces. He said, وصف البحتري إيوان كسرى وشفتني القصور من عبد شمسي. He intertextualized with البحتري in order to support the same motive. The fact that empires fall just like that and what remains of them is nothing but ruins. And that's what al Bukhtir was worried about, and as well as what Ahmad Shawqi was worried about when he lamented the presence of the Arabs in Spain, especially in Granada. Another example where we have opposition rather than support involves again Ahmed Shawqi and someone else here that is Ibrahim Tuqan, Al-Sha'ir Ibrahim Tuqan. Ahmed Shawqi praised the status of teachers by saying قُمْ لِلْمُعَلِّمِ وَفِهِ التَّبْجِيلَ كَادَ الْمُعَلِّمُ أَنْ يَكُونَ رَسُولًا Later on, Ibrahim Tuqan lamented the status of teachers. He said, قُمْ لِلْمُعَلِّمِ وَفِهِ التَّبْجِيلَ كَادَ الْمُعَلِّمُ أَنْ يَكُونَ قَتِيلًا وَلَيْسَ رَسُولًا and here we have two motives. One praising the status of the teacher and the other lamenting the status of the teacher. How? By intertextualizing. That is what we call intertextuality. And make sure that when you produce this course, you intertextualize and make your intertextuality explicit in order to make it in order to make your discourse more coherent why because intertextuality is in fact a source of poeticness if you have two poems one that does not intertextualize explicitly another and another that intertextualizes explicitly other things being equal the one that intertextualizes is more poetic than the one that does not intertextualize thank you very much and goodbye